Good morning, Calvary Hills Baptist Church. If you're joining us for the first time today, uh, we are in a series called Ask Anything, which allows you to ask questions uh, of the scriptures, and I will do my best to answer them. Uh, you can still submit a question anytime to calvaryhillsbaptist.org slash ask. Uh, I believe the Bible can answer any questions that we have. Last week we saw uh, that uh, we, we looked at the reliability of scripture, ways that we know it is a reliable, a historical, inspired work. Uh, and so today's question is one that I hand selected out of our pile because I believe that the timing is likely something that we're all dealing with right now uh, in, in one way or another. And the question is written like this. What do I do when it feels like everything is crumbling and fear is overtaking me? I'm sure we've all been there at least at one point in our lives. Uh, the way that this question was written could be someone talking about their specific personal life, personal issues. It also could be somebody um, talking about uh, nationally, globally, what's going on and sort of the just the unique time that we're living in this year. Uh, 2020 has been a tough one for the world, a time of fear, a time of chaos. Uh, early in the year, we were told uh, very vaguely that there was a virus hitting China, but it was not clear how deadly, how contagious it was. There were Early reports, it was really just another flu. Uh, most of us moved on with life and didn't think much about it. Then in mid-March, everything changed. I can remember uh, coming home from a Wednesday night prayer meeting here at Calvary Hills and uh, checking my phone. And I remember seeing a notification, the NBA has suspended its season. It was just like, what? The, the billion dollar NBA? That's big. Uh, within a week, everything was shut down. Schools and malls and theme parks and movie theaters, dining and restaurants, sporting events. Uh, our, our city here banned gatherings of 10 or more, a unique thing. We really didn't know what we were up against, uh, and to our credit, the media changed their story every week. The CDC and the World Health Organization weren't, weren't, felt like weren't being straight with us. How contagious is it? Well, what ages are most affected? Does the virus thrive in cold weather climates, or does warm weather have nothing to do with it? Do masks help you, hurt you, indifferent? Do we have to wear them? Should we not wear them? Uh, there's not enough toilet paper anywhere to be found. Maybe you remember the great toilet paper shortage. Uh, there was no, uh, there were talks of making homemade masks because we couldn't find masks at, at stores. N95 masks were impossible to find. Uh, no Lysol, no hand sanitizer anywhere to be found. Uh, don't go to the store unless you absolutely have to. Essential workers, non essential workers. Sanitize your Amazon packages, your, all your groceries, wipe them down. Unemployment, probably going to hit 30%, we're told. Death counts are overinflated. Death counts are underinflated. There aren't enough ventilators. There are warehouses full of ventilators. Uh, we can't work for three months. Here's $1,200. Uh, it doesn't seem as bad as you said it would be. Oh, but imagine if we didn't do what we did, how bad it would be. Yeah, but your model's factored in how bad uh, you, it would be and, and all the precautions. So, And then prepare now for the second wave that is going to come. We're told all of these things, some contradictory, some we don't even know what to believe. And just as it felt like we were limping over the finish line, many people depressed, anxious, barely making it, things starting to look up. A video comes out of Minneapolis, George Floyd on video, seemingly as we watch him die on camera, a police officer with a knee on his neck, other officers observing between eight and nine minutes. It's a difficult thing. Most everybody was shocked, I think, uh, initially. Even usual detractors of this kind of thing had to agree. This is bad. This is not good. This is not right. And for about two days, maybe it felt like everybody was in agreement that this was unacceptable. The officers need to be dealt with, charged, um, an investigation done. But then protests began to develop, spread to other cities. It became bigger than just Minneapolis. Peaceful protests chanting the name of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, seemed to be mixed in with rioters and looters, and many of the righteous calls for justice were being drowned out by opportunists seizing the moment for instability and anarchy, and allow, allowing the original message to be blurred to a watching world. Social media flooded of images with downtown cities being uh, sacked, standoffs with officers in riot gear, vehicles on fire, stores being looted, in my hometown of Polk County, Florida, uh, there were concerns that violent mobs uh, were going to leave downtowns and, and head to the suburban neighborhoods. And uh, Sheriff Grady Judd took to the news and said 
take your guns, blow anybody back out of your house who unlawfully enters it. It was a good sound bite. This week in Seattle, there are reports of an area seized by protesters called the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, or CHAZ, inside of Seattle with borders and armed guards, and the city is fully allowing this to take place. Some of you may be greatly concerned about the state of our nation for various reasons, for racial injustice reasons, for um, uh, anarchy reasons, for all sorts of uh, instability reasons, maybe all the above. Maybe your personal life is in such great distress right now that you can't see past your own life to even note what's happening in the country. So what do we do when we feel like everything is crumbling around us, when fear is overtaking us? Maybe you've been there at some point at least in the last three months, or maybe you're there right now. Well, I have a word from Psalm 46 today that I believe will encourage you, and it is this. Our God is greater than any earthly chaos, and we can experience peace as we keep him in our midst. And I would challenge you today to firmly plant God in the midst of your life so that you might not be moved by the swirling torrent of chaos and fear. Let's pray as we begin to look to the word. Lord, we come to you, many hurting, even Lord, this questioner, dealing with fear. Father, would you calm us, give us a moment of clarity as your word is proclaimed. May we trust in your words, and Lord, may you center us upon you. Calm us, bring us great peace because of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn to your Bibles in Psalm 46 today. That's where we're going to be. Psalm 46, a message I've titled, Fear, Chaos, and a Sovereign God. As a reminder, our questioner asked for biblical guidance when it seems like the world is crumbling and fear is winning. Psalm 46 is one of the most beautifully written psalms in my opinion. I love it. It's a favorite of mine. So let's read it in its entirety up front. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, a holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariot with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. As you probably notice in your copy of God's word, this psalm breaks naturally into three stanzas. Uh, a, a selah after each stanza, which is really nice for preachers. And so I'm just going to take what God gives me. Those three are going to be three points. Number one, God is a refuge in trouble not a removal from trouble, all right? And remember, I'm trying to encourage you how not to have fear overtake you in your life. So number one, this is important to know, God is a refuge in trouble, not a removal from trouble. It's one thing to cling to the promises of God, to claim the promises of God, uh, and we should do that. It's a biblical thing. It's another thing to cling to promises God never made because that's only going to hurt you in the end. Uh, there are some... Uh, noteworthy pastors and teachers who would tell you that the moment you become a Christian, you have exempted your life from pain or hardship or struggle. The football team with the most Christians or the Christian head coach will always win the game, we are told, Philippians 4.13. The airplane with the Christian pilot shouldn't go down in turbulence. The Christian homeowner will never have their house robbed. The Christian business owner will never have to close up shop. That's what we're told. And thus, we subtly subtly lead people to believe that there might be a worldly benefit to coming to Christ, a, a quid pro quo of sorts. 
this strategy won't work very well on the front end. Um, who, you know, who doesn't want their life to be better, safer, more wealthy? I mean, everyone wants that from their life. The only problem is that, well, life comes at you fast. As the boxer Mike Tyson says, everyone has a plan until they're punched in the mouth. It doesn't take long as we watch the news and we uh, look around, we see followers of Christ do experience pain, hardship, suffering, really at the same rate as non-Christians. Now, we should be making better life choices that don't lead us down roads of pain we've brought upon ourselves, but tragedy befalls us the same. Uh, over the last few months, there has been a quiet, underreported persecution in a small African nation of Burkina Faso. It's estimated 100,000 Christians have been displaced from their homes, many killed, unknown numbers killed, worship services been stormed by Islamic jihadists regularly. These brothers and sisters of ours are living proof of the words of John 15, 20. If they persecuted me, Jesus said, then they will persecute you. And so why do I tell you this? It's because often you can't find this message with a search warrant in many leading churches. At the first sign of trouble, when it does come, when trouble does come, Christ followers get confused. I, I thought this wasn't supposed to happen to me. I thought following Jesus was going to exempt me from trouble. And that's why we as Christians must have John 16, on our speed dial. In this world, you will have trouble. Will have, not might have. In this world, you will have trouble. But the verse continues. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Now, what does that mean? It means that you are going to have troubles. It means that you are going to have to live out your Christian life through hardship and difficulty. Um, but you get two benefits that the world doesn't have. First of all, you have Christ as a personal friend who will walk with you and strengthen you when trouble comes. The world doesn't have that. And secondly, you have an assurance that one day Christ will return to make all things new, to right wrongs, to vindicate you in the life that you've lived now. Our pain and our fears and our sufferings, they are real. They are absolutely real. They can be devastatingly painful. But we also know that there is an end coming to our pain. And this life will be like a, a grain of sand on the beach of eternity in the full presence of God. Look back at verse 1, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Now everybody at home say, in trouble. That's right, in trouble. He is your refuge, your strength, in trouble. Meaning, you will endure trouble. Verse 2 says, therefore, so you're going to endure trouble, therefore, in light of God being our refuge, smack in the middle of trouble, we will not fear. Look at the words, the earth gives way, the mountains move into the sea, waters roar and foam, mountains tremble. To the ancient world, the word pictures that we see here were chaos pictures based on their greatest threats, their, their unknown. The greatest threats of the unknown to the ancient world were chaotic weather scenes, deep oceans, earthquakes. These were pictures of instability, the breaking down of the known. This is uncreation language. When life is falling apart and all that is known to me is crumbling, we are told we will not fear. Why? Because God is a very present help in trouble. Now, I want to dig into the placement of that help of God. As point number two, we'll do that. Number two, God's setting determines our stability. God's setting, that is his placement, the setting that he holds, determines our stability in life. Look with me as we refresh Psalm 46, 4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. I love how this passage is placed in contrast to the previous passage. The deep waves of the ocean in verses 1 through 3 are, are crashing, waters foaming, mountains tossed into the sea. And then the words, there is a river. Now, the author doesn't say, but there is a river, but he basically implies it's a contrast picture. In Hebrew literature, the oceans and the seas were symbols of fear, unknown, dangerous travel, 
large mysterious creatures lurking in the deep. And this is in a, a stark contrast to the gentle river that runs through, a, a gentle stream that passes by. A biblical image of life, and strength, and peace was the river. Cities were built on rivers so that drinking water was available. Cities with rivers were considered more hardy cities when battles happened. They had their own water supply. And so we have a contrasting picture here of a city which the author calls the city of God. Certainly with Zion in mind, but also standing as a metaphor for the individual life which drinks from God's river. The city of God is the holy dwelling of the Most High God. Verse 5 says, God is in her midst. She shall not be moved. So whether today your, your main application needs to be uh, to the nation, whether it's to this church, whether it's to an individual life, the message really is the same, and it is this. When God is in your midst, when the river of life flows through you, when God has made his dwelling securely in your midst, you shall not be moved. The setting determines the stability. What does that mean? It means that the stability or the unshakability of your life is absolutely and completely dependent upon whether or not God is in your midst. If God is in your midst, therefore you shall not be moved, is true. And it is. Then logically, the reverse is true. If God is not in your midst, then you shall be moved. You see? That's how that works. And you've all experienced that in your life, and you experientially know what I'm saying. When you take God, Christian, when you take God from the central position of your life, and you give that setting up to something else, anything else, good things, bad things, there is an eventual instability of your life that follows. It's true of your personal life. It's true of a church. It's true of a nation. That feeling of fear, that feeling of chaos, winning in your life. You ever feel like chaos is just winning? It's all falling apart. That feeling is often a symptom that something else is occupying the midst of your life. A central position of authority in your life has been claimed by an outsider. You have traded out the immortal God for some golden calf. And the golden calf will not help you. Listen, will not help you when the morning dawns like God will. That feeling of fear, life-crumbling feelings, often identified as your cry out for your idol to save you. But alas, it does not come to comfort you, as idols will not and cannot. The prophets of Baal cut themselves and they shouted and limped, but no one answered, as idols do not answer your call. Maybe the unshakable fears and discomfort at the chaos around us Maybe it's really a cry to our false gods to come save us. It's a cry to our false god of security and comfort that we have built and that we have placed in the midst of our city, occupying a throne designed only for the Most High God. Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. God of Jacob is our fortress. And so if you have removed the Lord from the midst of your life, if you drink from another stream than the river of life, listen, do not be surprised when the mountains begin to quake, the ground beneath your feet begins to shake, the oceans roar and tumble. You see, we know where this big story is headed. Revelation 22, we see a scene that is not unlike the one that we see in Psalm 46. John sees the final scene of the Bible unfold, and he sees the city of God built on a river. And it's in this passage where we realize that the psalm writer of 46 is eventually looking forward to the end. Permit me to read Revelation 22, the final scene of the Bible. John says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, 
and his servants will worship him. And they see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more, and they will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. This is where we are headed. The final river city of God, with Jesus sitting on the throne, the nations healed, the curse gone, night and darkness gone, the worship of God upon our lips. So if somebody ever asks you, what makes heaven so awesome? And you say, the streets of gold and the mansions. Know that I will personally disown you in a loving way. What makes heaven so awesome is the same thing that makes our life immovable. The same thing that casts aside our fear in a chaotic world. It's the same answer, what makes heaven so awesome and what casts out our fear. It's that Jesus is sitting upon the throne smack dab in the middle. He occupies the central spot and acts like an anchor for the soul when chaos is abounding. God is in the midst of her, therefore she shall not be moved. God's setting determines our stability. If God is somewhere in the city of your life, but not firmly planted in the middle, not the bedrock, I would challenge you today to reorient your life Put God as the central unifying theme of your existence. You will be much less likely to be swept up in every new fad of changing wind of society. You will be much less likely to be swept up in fear as a marionette of the media. And may you say, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of my life. The habitation of the Most High God is in my midst. I shall not be moved. God will help me when the morning comes. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter, but God speaks and it all melts away. The Lord of hosts, the God of Jacob, is my fortress. God is a refuge in trouble. God's setting determines our stability. And finally, number three, God's sovereignty shapes our serenity. God's sovereignty shapes our serenity. Many of us see that word serenity, we know what it means. It means basically peace. Perhaps you can hear the voice of Frank Costanza shouting, serenity now. But what about the other word that I chose? Sovereignty. What about that word? Holman Bible Dictionary defines the sovereignty of God as such. God possesses all power and is the ruler of all things. God rules and works according to his eternal purpose, even through events that seem to contradict or oppose his rule. So that's sovereignty. I think that's a good definition. There are varying degrees to which people believe the Bible teaches a sovereign God. It runs the gamut from completely sovereign over all things, like the definition we just read, to sovereign over all things except my will and my decisions, to sovereign over some things but doesn't know the future, to sovereign over very little, learning and growing and experiencing growth like we do. I would argue that the biblical position is that God is indeed sovereign over all things without exception. That's a biblical hermeneutical conviction that I have, but I would present to you now that there is another reason to embrace the full sovereignty of God in your life. The reason is this. There is a direct causal relationship to the peace that you experience deep in your soul and to the sovereignty of your God. The greater power and rule and authority and knowledge that you believe is possessed by God will result in greater peace and serenity in your soul. Let me explain this, but look with us uh, to the final stanza of Psalm 46, 8. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolation on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Now, I'm going to ask you momentarily, listener, to suspend your, your coffee cup, uh, Hobby Lobby, wall art Christianity for a moment as we look to verse 10. I know it's famous, but don't think about that. Be still and know that I am God is a bit more than take a chill pill and relax. God's got this. It's a little more than that. So remember that the world in the time of the Psalms uh, was 
very acquainted with war. When this was written, war was not strange and distant. If you lived your entire life in the ancient world without experiencing an army marching upon your city gates where you lived, it was a rare exception. Uh, the world was just a bloody place. It just was. The mixing of God and the ideals of warfare were not seen as a strange juxtaposition to the listener. Uh, this was everyday life. And so uh, the same way that we today think about getting a promotion or going to college of choice or uh, a rise and fall in the stock market, that's the way the ancient world thought about warfare. It just was normal. So as you read through all these Psalms, notice there is a theme of war involved. Um, God's help towards his people in battle was seen as a, a normal way that God assisted and helped his people because it was their real life. That was their day to day. And so as pagan nations marched upon Israel and Judah, uh, they would cry out to God to assist them in battle, to fight for and with them in actual warfare. And so this is the setting of the final stanza of Psalm 46. The author paints a picture. He's looking out over a fresh battlefield after the conclusion of a hard fight. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. In other words, look at how he fought with his people and brought victory. He makes the wars cease. And by the way, that's not a pacifist statement. It's saying he fights the battle and wins it. He breaks the bow. He shatters the spear. He burns the chariot with fire. Do you see the picture? Let me tell you what you're looking at. You're looking, when he says, come behold, he's saying, look at this battlefield of carnage. Overturned chariots, spears and arrows protruding from the earth. Bodies of the enemy strewn about the field. There is an eerie silence as the fog of war lifts. And it is in this silence that we hear those words ring out. Be still and know that I am God, and I will be exalted in the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The call to the Christian to be still, literally cease striving, is spoken one breath after a display of the Lord's great power over his enemies, and one breath before a statement that he will be exalted in the earth. So, what? The stillness that you seek in your life, you who are fearful. The peaceful disposition that you seek, the life free of anxiousness, of depression, of fear, is inseparable from the existence of a sovereign God who possesses all power to fight your battles and to declare by the word of his mouth that he will accomplish victory and then go do it. That is a sovereign God. A sovereign God can accomplish all that his will sets out to do and no created thing can frustrate it. That is where your peace comes from. That is the hub of your peace. That is the source of your serenity. The size and power of your God is directly connected to the level of the depth of peace in your heart. I can't be still if I have doubts that God can handle himself. I'm not sure of his credentials and resume. Well, I can't be still then. I can't see striving if I'm worried that he can handle his business. Have you ever had to work on a collaborative project? Maybe you have to go back to uh, school to think about this, or maybe in your work environment you, you frequently have group uh, projects. But have you ever had to work on a collaborative project with somebody and you began to have doubts that they were going to pull their weight in this project? Or that they were going to do their job when it counted? When the final presentation was made, that they were going to show up and bring the same effort and fire that you were going to bring to that project and slam it home? Do you ever have that doubt? You know what you can't do in that situation? You can't be still. You can't rest. You can't have a moment of peace in your heart. If I have a, a senior level thesis that is going to graduate me from college and my assignment partner has given me reason to doubt that they are going to come through in the clutch, that they are going to be capable of handling their workload, that their half of the project is going to be done, you either, you all have been here, either you, the hard worker, have to do their work for them, you have to just say, hey, let me handle this, I'll ride my coattails, 
or you have to live in constant fear that at presentation day, they will either not show up, they'll show up late, or they'll show up unprepared. Either way, there's no rest in that scenario. There's no serenity in that scenario. And that is how it is with our lives. Listen, you cannot get the be still part without the and know that I am God part. Unless you believe that he will be exalted in the nations and the earth, you cannot be still. God's sovereignty shapes our serenity. And now we're back to the original question. What do I do when it feels like everything is crumbling and fear is winning? Fear is overtaking me. First of all, you must remember God is a refuge in your trouble, not a removal from your trouble. He allowed his people to endure slavery in Egypt before he brought them out. He allowed the apostles to be persecuted greatly for their faith. And most of all, he allowed his own son to endure the cross for us. Hardship is not a license to turn away from God, but rather an invitation to take refuge in God during the trouble. Secondly, remember that the setting which you place God in will determine the stability of your life. If you place God somewhere in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth position of power, of authority, of recognition in your life, you will experience instability when the waves roar and crash against your house. You will fall apart mentally and spiritually if you place anything else in the midst of your life. But if you place God in your midst, you will not be moved when the waves come crashing, like the man who built his house on the solid rock. Lastly, number three, remember that worship is not just something you do. It affects your outlook on life. If you have a view of God, which is anything other than absolutely sovereign, your serenity will be the first to go. If you believe in a sovereign God who breaks the bow and bends the spear and tells the wars to cease, however, you can experience stillness. God is greater than any earthly chaos. We can experience peace as we steadfastly keep him in our midst. Plant God firmly in the center of your life and take refuge in him. Take refuge in the cross of Jesus Christ. It won't keep the swirling waters and chaos from coming to your door, but you will be prepared and you will be made immovable. May we cease striving today and trust in Christ. God bless. Have a great day.